Welcome back to another episode of That's Business. Today's guest, Tommy Frank, is a brand new friend of mine that we had a conversation last week, both bonded over being Italian, only he's got more street cred being from Long Island so than I have here in Michigan. But besides that point, we have so much to talk about here of just how interesting you are. And I had so many questions on the consultation, but Starting off, did you always want to be a lawyer or what were you like as a child or would you want to be when you grew up? I didn't always want to be a lawyer, but I was told I should be at like kindergarten. (laughs) One of the lunch ladies, I don't know what I was quibbling over with her, but she said, you're either going to be a comedian or a lawyer. And I think I ended up being both, but it, it didn't really, it was never in my mind as to like, that's what I want to be when I grow up until I was like 20. Oh my gosh. And then I was like, uh, you know, maybe this is what I'll be. It wasn't like this uh, burning desire, like I have to be a lawyer, you know, for the good of all or something like Atticus Finch. It was something was, so I forget what was exactly happened, but high school was a lot of fun. I had a lot of fun in high school. Like all my friends from grammar school went to the same high school. So it was just like this giant grouping of kids and we were just really there to have fun. My first year of freshman year, I got an award at the end of the year, like never missed a day and never had a detention. Nice. And senior year, I think I got the same award, just the opposite. Like most detentions and most missed days. Uh, And it it was just like, you know, I would show up to class, figure out I wasn't interested about five minutes and I would say, okay, I'm going to go. Oh, you were one of those. You're like, I'm good. I'm out. But it was like, you know, that's what we all did. And we all like, did fine. Maybe we didn't fail classes or anything like that. It was just, we figured out what was the bare minimum we had to do. And we did that. And then we just kind of like hung out after that. But when college started, I was still in that mindset of I'll do the bare minimum and I'll just hang out with my friends. So speaking of, you know, Italian American, I went to St. Francis College my first year, which is in Brooklyn Heights, which is like a beautiful area of Brooklyn. I was going every day with the intention of going to class, but then like my friends would be like, hey, Tom, we just cut the deck. We're about to play cards. <laughs> and it, it was like every day it was the elevator to class and like cafeteria where the cards were being dealt. And I was like, I'll go to class tomorrow. I have to ask, what was the game? What was the game of choice? Casino. You ever play casino? Yes. So yeah, yeah that, that was, that. I don't know why that game always, but there were others. But it was that was usually the one. And that was the one I played in high school, too. So it was like just an easy progression for me in, you know, my education moving forward. And then something happened. My GP dropped to like 2.5. And then it dropped to like 1.5. Ooh. I was basically uh, like a character from the movie Animal House. I don't know if you've ever seen it. <laughs> I love it. My, yeah, yeah. Yeah, my mom does the quote. She always says, fat, stupid, and drunk are no way to go through life. That's like the family motto. Yeah, yeah. So we we are big Animal House fans in this household. So yes. Yeah. So I was turning into Bluto. I was like, you know, Bluto, John Blutarski, 1.0. And I was never that way. Like I, I always did well in school when I like applied myself, but like that was kind of bad. So I went home one day and my mother was like, you're turning into a bum. Ooh. And it was like, I don't know, those words, I still hear them like ringing in my ear. I was like, oh, yeah. And then like it was the next day I was driving to school that I didn't want to go to because this is after St. Francis College. I basically gotten kicked out and uh, I'm like driving and I'm like on Queens Boulevard, headed to school. And I was at a red light driving my mother's like minivan. And I was like, what's the opposite of a bum? And I, the, the first word that came to my mind was lawyer. I was like, all right, I'll be that. And I went to, uh, what do they call that person? Like a counselor? Like career, career advisor? counselor? Yeah, yeah exactly. Mm-hmm. And I was like, how do I become a lawyer? And he's like, you should be pre-law major, which is like poly- political science. I was like, all right, I'll do that. So like I did that. And then my GPA was like, uh, it went to like a three the next semester. And then it was like a three nine the semester after that. Wow. And that's like, that's kind of how I went to college. So that was like the big, I want to be a lawyer moment. So it wasn't like, you know, from childhood or anything like that. It was basically in response to a dare from my mother. (laughs) I mean, it worked. It worked out because I love it. Like, I love being an attorney. I love like how it challenges you. 
it just kind of worked out. So that lunch lady and my mother, you know, knew something that I didn't at the time. Right. It's so funny you say that about your being a bum, because I remember we always say like, oh, don't say the D word of disappointment is our big joke in the family. Yeah. But I can remember on one hand how many times my mother said she's disappointed in me. And that rings in yeah. my head, I think, until the day I pass of I'm disappointed in you or when I'm feeling down like that. Like, yes, I'm going to challenge you and I'm going to be that way, too. So, you yeah. know, right there with you, Tommy, on the personality yeah. and the it's ingrained in your head forever. So and because there's so many specialties you can do being a lawyer, transitioning into, OK, you have a three nine amazing that you're applying yourself because I've also never been a school kid and studying is just not my thing. Social is more important. So I agree with you on that. Right. So talk us through transitioning. You know how to do this. And one question before that, was the career counselor supportive of you? Because some stories I've heard, they're like, sweetheart, what do you think you're doing? Like, this is your GPA. You can't do that. But what was that experience first? No, he was awesome. He was like, because you know what, like uh, the precursor to law really is history. So if you're like studying like John Locke or any of those like enlightenment thinkers, which is all like what your history class is in college, it's all like the precursor to our legal system right now. So if you're interested in that, then you're, you know, they're going to see that like this is kind of the transition to law. So he taught that class for me. Oh, okay. He taught like enlightenment thought. And that was like the one class I like participated in. Stayed the whole time. <laughs> Showed up. <laughs> you know, did assignments all the time. So he was like this cool, uh, he was like a Jamaican, like I think he was from Jamaica. So he had like that really thick Jamaican accent. And he just said like, so cool. He was like, yeah, I think you'd be great at that. He's like, but you got to apply yourself. Like this ain't going to cut it. And it was like, shot, shot me straight. And was like, you know, you're going to have to, he's like, to get into a good accredited law school, you're going to need at least a three, five, you know, before you take the LSAT, like you're going to have to get a good grade on the LSAT, but you're going to need at least a three, five. So that's, that's got to be the mark. So aim higher than that, but that's got to be where you are. Like, you know, John Bluto 1.75 GPA is not getting recognized no. unless you get a 180 at a 180. So he was really supportive. I checked in with him after that because he was, I don't remember if he was an attorney, but he had his JD. Mm -hmm. That much I know. So yeah, he was supportive. And that, that was really all I need was like a little... Like a little pat, like, let's go, you know, enough messing around. If someone had said, no, I don't think so at that point in time, it pro probably would have been the same result. Between that person and my mother, I probably would have been like, all right, I'm going to embarrass you now. Right. And it sounds like that mentality has always been a piece of you, especially if a kindergarten lunch lady was telling you that. But yeah. no, I love that. I'm absolutely on board with that. So when you decide your specialty or walk us through get your undergrad, go into law school, where, and I want you to talk on what you specialize in and everything now, you go the corporate route. So give us that chunk of your life and then we'll transition into your own firm you have now. Sure. So when you go to law school, you're pretty much a blank slate. There's some people who go there who like have family in the law and know what they want to do or they've had so many discussions like around the dinner table about different cases. And, you know, if there was a family member who was like a criminal defense attorney, they could be like, well, I never want to do that. Or that sounds fascinating, like dealing with people's civil liberties and things like that. And that's my wife's like that. Her father was a big personal injury attorney. I think he did criminal defense as well, had a lot of success. So she had kind of that background where she knew the different areas of law a little bit more intimately than someone who was like totally green. No first lawyer in his family walking in like, like, hi, <laughs> where do I get coffee? Right. right. So you walk in and you don't really... I walked in because I loved Entourage, the show Entourage. Oh. I wanted to be Ari Kold, <laughs> right? So I wanted to just like be screaming and making funny jokes and like wheeling and dealing. And that's what I wanted to be. And like I ended up the opposite. Like Ari Gold's dealing with athletes and actors at their financial pinnacle. And I'm a bankruptcy attorney. So <laughs> exactly. After they've spent all the money and like that time's passed, then like, like they come to me and again, I'm there like, hi. Uh, so I went in wanting to be Ari Gold, but I went to St. John's and St. John's has like a wonderful bankruptcy law program. And it's like one of the only law schools in the nation. I think it's the only one that has an LLM, which is like a master's at law. So like if you really wanted to specialize in the field of law, you could get your JD and then an LLM. Oh, wow. 
and they have all the, you know, an LLM program and all the teachers are the judges in this district. So Eastern District of New York, Southern District of New York, judges you're going to appear before your teachers. And like judges I appear before every day were, you know, my teachers. And it just kind of, someone said, I've always been like a guy who's just interested by everything. Uh, like I constantly want to learn more. If someone's, if I don't know anything about something, I'll just keep asking that person questions about it. And I'll like do my own research just because I'm intrigued by it. Like I have no gift in understanding science, like none whatsoever. Me either. But I'm, the problem is I'm fascinated by it. So it's like, I, I type in like, you know, string theory for children to try to grasp the concept. And I still don't, but you know, things like that. I love, and uh, someone said like, it was like the first week or second week and they were like, bankruptcy is a cool area of law because it involves every other area of law. Ooh. You will come across every other area of law in bankruptcy aside from criminal defense sentencing and child paternity, right? Everything else is open season. And it's true. Like you could have someone suing you for assault and then you go into bankruptcy and that person, you know, now the issue in the bankruptcy case is whether or not you're liable for assault and whether or not that debt should be discharged or not. So now it's like, you're not a bankruptcy attorney. Now you're a PI attorney inside, you know, applying bankruptcy rules. So that's the part that like really intrigued me. And then it just kind of progressed from there throughout high school where I took more and more bankruptcy classes. I started to work for a bankruptcy attorney who was just the a wild guy. Like he's a great guy, but I don't know if I mentioned it to you, like some of the stories with him, he was like a, a learn by fire type of a guy. And I told him, look, well, listen, I don't want to do transactional stuff. I want to do litigation. I want the me versus you dynamic. I always enjoyed that with sports when I was a kid. I never like took it personally, but it, I liked that competition. And he was like, all right, well, I don't know how to do litigation. So you're going to figure it out. And this is like, well, this is through law school, right? I'm in law school during this time. So in your early 20s at this time? Yeah. So, okay. And he, he was like, let's go. And if the work was bad, like he let you know. He was like, uh, he would give you the tools, but there were like certain non-negotiables with him. And it was like, if I asked him a question that I could have figured out the answer to myself, that was a problem. If I went to him with a legal question and I didn't do like exhaustive research on that issue to try to figure out myself and I wasn't ready for a dialogue with him about that issue, that was a problem. Like if I came in like, I don't want to do work. I want to ask you the question. That was a problem. But if I came in like, dude, I looked everywhere. You know, I did research on here and there and I'm stuck. Then he would like sit and spend a lot of time with me and be like, this is where you're missing it. These are the issues you got to be paying attention to. So I said, that's what I want to do. And he'd just start taking on litigation work. And he was like, I know enough to coach you in the early stages, but after a certain point, it's going to be you. So um, there was this one case where this is like, this is what I want to do. Like, this gets me riled up. And it was a case. I don't want to bore you with like bankruptcy law, but. No, I no, I want to hear it. I want to hear it. When you file for bankruptcy, there's things called exemptions. And exemptions are assets or portions of assets that the trustee can't touch. And creditors can't touch. So like if you go into chapter seven and you have assets, theoretically, the trustee who was assigned by the court can take those assets, sell them and pay your unsecured creditors with them. You know, a poor portion never was available. But if you have an exemption, that means the trustee can't touch that asset. Not to interrupt, but can you like simplify it even more for those that may be listening and know nothing about this of what counts as an untrusted yeah, sure. asset so, and all? Okay. Let's say you own a home. Mm -hmm. and you go into Chapter 7 bankruptcy, either federal law or state law will say a portion of the equity in that house. So let's say you have $100,000 in equity. In New York State, you could exempt $170,000 of equity in your home if you're in bankruptcy. So if you go to bankruptcy and it's a million-dollar home and the mortgage is $900,000, there's $100,000 worth of equity. If there are no exceptions, the trustee is going to be like, all right, I'm going to sell this house, take that $100,000 right after I pay off the bank and disperse that $100,000. But because I have a homestead exemption, he can't touch that hundred grand. Mm, okay. Right? So it protects that portion of the equity. Uh, it's like it just takes it and puts it in a box and nobody can touch it. So you go through bankruptcy and still have that asset. You don't lose it, 
right? Because the, the alternative is you go through bankruptcy and you leave with nothing. So now people are dependent on the state for assistance, which is not like we don't want to do that to people either. Bankruptcy is supposed to give people a fresh start. So you don't want them leaving. Well, like, oh, great, I have a fresh start, but now I don't have a home and I don't have a car and I don't have cash in my pocket. Like, how am I going to live? It wouldn't make sense. So that's why exemptions exist. But in New York, in order to claim the homestead exemption, the one for your home, you have to live there and you have to own it. Right. You have to have those two things just basically. And this lady was a domestic abuse survivor and she wasn't living in the home. So the trustee objected to her claiming of the homestead exemption. And he's saying, okay, this 150 grand at the time, it was less than 170. It increases every three years. He said, listen, you know, give me this 150,000. This woman is like domestic abuse. And to his credit, he's not looking at it the way I'm looking at it. He's looking at it as I am a fiduciary. Right. I am like a financial advisor. I have an obligation to the unsecured creditors. I have to make these arguments. I may not like them. It's not for his personal game, but it is what it is. So I was a uh, 3L in law school. So I'm still in law school. And uh, he calls my boss at the time. And this is, you know, the guy who would throw a phone at my head if I was <laughs> way off base. Yeah. But if I wrote something perfect, he would say that was perfect and that was beautiful. And thank you. Great work. Right. He gave credit where it was due. But if you messed up, he let you know. So he called my boss and was like, hey, you know, uh, I filed uh, an objection to the exemption, right? I filed my objection to your claim that that money belongs to your client. And if you oppose it, I think it's sanctionable. So my boss goes, well, I'm going to have Tommy take a look at it and we'll get back to you. And he's like, yeah, tell your little law clerk, <sighs> the verbatim, tell your little law clerk. And this man is a seasoned trustee who I respect, right? But this was the words, tell your little law clerk, that if he prepares an opposition, you file it, I'm, I'm going to seek sanctions, which basically means you submitted an argument to the court that has no basis in law or facts. Like, do you hear about that case where the attorney submitted like AI generated cases? Yes. The court sanctioned him because you submitted something false to the court. There was no basis in fact or law. And what are the repercussions of that? Usually a monetary fine. Okay. It's dependent on the circumstances, but like that guy who submitted the false cases was sanctioned $5,000, mm -hmm. right? So it's usually not that big of a deal, relatively speaking, but you just don't want to be sanctioned, right? You don't want to be known as someone who submitted like something that was frivolous. So I'm sitting in his office and I'm red hot, like steam's coming out of my ears. I was a little bit more temperamental when I was younger. And I was like, put him on mute. But he puts him on mute. I go, tell him, I said to go, right. <laughs> You could swear on here. We don't care. And I was like, tell him I said, go fuck himself. And that the opposition is going to be on his desk Monday morning. It was Friday, like 5 p.m. And he goes, he goes, I'm not going to say that. He takes him off mute. He's like, we disagree. You're going to have your opposition Monday morning. Right. So that like all weekend, that's like 8 a.m. to 9 p.m. Saturday, Sunday. Op was ready Monday morning. My boss filed it. There was oral. Like, we ended up like getting her a really good settlement. Good. But at the time, I, of course, I couldn't argue it because I wasn't admitted. But my boss said he was like, that was the most intense argument I've ever been a part of. Like, I had sweat rings around my, you know, my butt. Down, like, and, and he, he was like a not, he would lose his temper, but typically not in court. Right. Like, he was like very together. That scenario, it was like something connected all at once. It was like, I enjoy the fight. And I enjoy proving someone wrong. And like every once in a while, those two things will happen at the same time for someone who really needs it. And it's like, this is what I should do. Right. And like, it just, something went on then. And I still think that, that case happened 12 years ago at this point. And that's still somewhere in the motor that is me. That case is like somewhere there. That was just like an aha moment for me where it's like, this is what I want to do. It's just like the whole undermining you thing of really your little yeah. law clerk. Like, are you just so insecure on yourself or just try to use intimidation? I mean, it just cracks me up. And I had similar story, yeah. like early 20s, you know, working a job, number one in the company. And he's like, oh, you're going to regret this. You're a piece of shit. You're this and that. Yeah. Like, <laughs> you don't know who you're talking to. And yep, grew up in sports too, to your point earlier of 
tell me I can't do something and I'm not going to be in the box. I'm going to explode your box and do more. So right. I love that fire. Yes. It's, I don't know. I watched Rocky a lot as a kid. So I think that's where it comes <laughs> from. <laughs> Every time I have to work on like a, an in-depth opposition or a brief or something that like Rocky 2 is going on. Rocky 2 leading into Rocky 3. Yes. And, you got Eye of the Tiger playing in the background as you're going. Yeah. Weird. Love it. Exactly. Exactly. You got Apollo screaming in my ear. Yes, it's great. Now you work for this guy. You obviously get admitted. So we have that added to the fuel of the fire of wanting to do bankruptcy and eventually start your own firm. So when did you decide? Was it right out of law school that you were doing your own firm? And how did that come to fruition? Uh, it wasn't right out of law school because right out of law school, you don't know anything. Right. Like you were, mm-hmm. you were as clueless as you could imagine. Like you have a very, very elementary understanding of the law and a little bit of an idea of what to watch out for. Like with my boss, you know, my mentor, I did get like kind of an accelerated program because he and I worked hand in hand with a lot of things. He gave me a lot of responsibility. He was always, you know, giving me a lot of oversight to make sure everything was correct. But by the third year of law school, he was like treating me like an associate you know, with the type of work and stuff like that. So by the time I left law school, I was a little bit of ahead of my contemporaries in that way. Because like some law school jobs you get and they're like, all right, watch this or do legal research. And it's like with my mentor, he was like, you need to know how to take something from beginning to end. And you should be starting at the end mentally and working your way back and figure out how you're going to get there. Uh, so I worked with him for a little bit, but, you know, post-grad, but you just, there's not, you don't, know anything. There's so little. And it's like, where am I going to find this information? And I wanted to do a clerkship. Like I wanted to work for a judge because you're just going to get so much information all day, every day, right? You're going to see phenomenal attorneys. You're going to see awful attorneys. You're going to see good ones, middle of the road. And you're going to see how they do things and the way they do things differently. So I clerked for a judge in Queens County. I'm originally from Queens moved out to Long Island, uh, 2019. Uh, so I went to clerk for the judge in Queens. I ended up clerking for two judges in Queens from November, 2015 to March, 2017. And that was awesome. Complete different dynamic because courts only open from nine to four 30, right? So you're not burning the midnight oil like you are in private practice. But those hours you're there, like so much information is consolidated because you're getting exposure to so many different areas of law. You're getting it from these really experienced attorneys. So it's like you just saw the whole scope. But there are some guys who are like, you just knew when the moment they walked in the door, you're like, this guy's going to have trash. Like there's (laughs) not a car in the street raised. And there's other guys who would just come in. One guy in particular who was like another mentor to me, just the coolest guy on the planet, like would come in like Canali suit. You know, his name, first name was John, but people called him Don, like like the Don. The Don, yep. Right? He'd come in and kiss these like, you know, he's Italian American. He would kiss the other attorneys like on the cheek. <laughs> like Irish guys, you know, it didn't matter. It didn't matter if you were Italian American or not. He would still give you like the kiss on the cheek. He's like, oh, ciao. And he was lights out, like experienced, polished. He had everything, right? So he would just sit there and, you know, other attorneys would yell and scream and everything like that. And he would just sit there and not say a word. He would just be at the end of the table, just kind of like this. And when everyone else shut up, he would say, here's the rule that says I'm right. Thanks. See you tomorrow. (laughs) Just like ruling for the Don. Like that was it, right? It was just, and you saw how, these really experienced, smart, capable attorneys that are like in the pinnacle of the legal field, how they behave. And they're not screaming. They're not yelling. They're not attacking their adversary. They're just like, this is what it says. Like emotional intelligence, right? Yeah. Right. Just here it is. And they, you know, but it was a just incredible experience. And I got so much knowledge from it so that when I, I left the clerkship because my now wife, who was my girlfriend at the time, was a DA in Miami. So we met at St. John's, but we were doing long distance this whole time post-grad. So like Friday night, I would get on a plane in LaGuardia, take the 740 to Fort Lauderdale, get there at 11. She would pick me up. We'd spend the weekend together. And then I would fly back, like taking the 5 a.m. flight out of Miami. 
would go land because the, the two airports are right by the courthouse. They're like 10 minutes away. So I would land, get there at like 8 a.m. And that I would start my work week. So we were doing long distance, but it was like, we had a great time, but 18 months was a while to be long distance. So I took the Florida bar, passed the Florida bar, and I got a job with a firm called Green Spoon Martyr, which is, you know, top 200 national law firm that like in Florida, they're absolute heavyweights. And they had recently expanded into New York. I think like a couple Ooh. months or that they had just opened their Midtown office. So they were like, their job posting was like, we want someone admitted in Florida and New York. We want them in Florida, but we want them to n- do New York law. I was like, someone like God has created this. <laughs> Throw you that job description. No kidding. Yeah, like I couldn't have wrote it better. Uh, so I applied. They hired me and I moved down like two days later, moved down to Florida. Wow. That was like the best best time of, you know, not the best time of our lives. It was just such a great time because we worked so hard to get to the point where we were living together and taking the uh, bar in a different state and moving. It's just a lot. So yeah, work there. So now I'm in Greenspoon and we're doing a lot of like financial services work. So like foreclosure issues with banks and stuff like that. And I'm just doing New York law, right? Doing it in Florida and uh, Fort Lauderdale. And it was great. I love Florida. We lived in Coral Gables and it was like, when we moved back, I was crying. I'm sitting in Fort Lauderdale, <laughs> like sobbing like a child. And everyone's like, this guy's losing his mind. <laughs> right. I'm in a full suit because I had court early in the day with like my life and luggage. Right. Because Amanda had already moved up because her job in New York started sooner. So I'm just like, guys, I'm just having a, you know, a close of chapter moment in my life. to so just, you know, give me some space. I'm good. <laughs> yeah, I'll be fine. Just, you know, just give me a minute. But yeah, we lived in Coral. I loved every part of it. And then uh, we moved back in uh, like November 2017. So uh, I was working, I was still in the same firm. I was with Greenspoon, but now I was just working in their Midtown office. Things were fine. Like everything was going great. Same work, doing well. And then my mentor called me and was like, hey, let's get lunch with another colleague. So I met them out in uh, the steakhouse out in Long Island. And we're sitting at the, the dinner table and he's like, Tommy. I'm done. I don't want to do this anymore. I've moved on to something else. I want you to buy my practice from me. And I was like, what? Like that? Like, no, I was not (laughs) going to go start my own firm. None of this was anticipated. My entire legal career is like at the behest of other people challenging me. Like, it's, I'm just, otherwise I would be coasting fine. But he was like, yeah, I don't want to do this anymore. Like, you know, all the clients, you know what needs to be done, you know how to do the work. So why don't we just work out a transition? And two months later, we had done it. I had left Greenspoon. I still talk to them all the time, but my partner at Greenspoon is the man. Like the guy who like supervised me, he was like the coolest dude on the planet, was like, gave me such like a pat on the back, like, go ahead, do do your thing. Wow. Set me work, like to keep me afloat in the early days. Like, love that guy. And uh, started in July, 2018. I've been doing it since. And Amanda joined the firm and... January 2019. That's how the firm start happened. And it just kind of morphed into this bigger thing that we weren't really anticipating. Well, it's interesting, too, because I feel like you have been presented with these opportunities where we do get opportunities. I mean, just and a lot of people do ignore them or it's just I mean, I'm a big like the universe tells you something or God tells you something, whatever you believe in. But yeah. It's interesting. And you had to feel like a badass that this seasoned lawyer who you have mad respect for. And just to say that your old boss gave you business, like who the hell can say that? I know I had a very different transitional experience, (laughs) but it's so fascinating. And that speaks to who you are as a person, as a lawyer and all. So I want to hear on the back end, because we had talked about this a little bit when we first met, how you decided that you and Amanda decided that it was a good move. Yeah. Because that's a hard, that's a hard one. Work with your partner, live with your partner. You have kids. Like, how did you make that decision? What went into it? You know, I don't know how much went into it. She was at a job that she didn't like. And then we kind of talked like, all right, well, you know, in order for a business to scale like a law firm, you need more attorneys. You can't only, like one attorney, a sole practitioner can only do so much. And that's a huge expense bringing on an associate, especially like at the time I was 30. So 
you know, bringing on an associate who's like, what the same age as me? How well is that going to go? Like right. me telling someone else to do something who's my age. Uh, so we're like, we could like expand just by bringing her on. And who would I trust more than her? Right. Like, or, you know, vice versa. When you're a DA, you have so much trial experience. And like a lot of attorneys don't have trial experience. So she's been, she's done more trials in the time she was a DA than most attorneys will ever do in their entire career. And that happened in the first two years of her career. So we're like, fine, let's give it a shot. It was so in, like the firm was such in its infancy stages. Like if it went wrong, what was the worst that could happen? Right? Like not, it's not like this huge firm and we're like, all right, we're going to have the CEO of this firm be husband and wife. Like that could be disastrous. But yes. it was like, all right. But those were, you know, some of those days were the best because when we moved back from Miami, we moved to Queens, right? So it's like, I'm from Queens originally, so I could say it, but it was like, you ever see the movie Coming to America? Yes. It's like when Eddie Murphy gets there and he's like, he's happy, but Arsenio Hall's like, what the hell am I doing exactly. here? Like, I was a school hall, even though I went back to my own town. And I was like, this sucks. So we were just trying to make the firm work and... You're just trying to pay your bills when you start a firm like that. Like you're just trying to keep things afloat. And uh, it just made sense. Like, you know, we were in it together. We were like in the trenches together. And that's like the way me and Amanda are just in generally, like every problem that we, we address it together. And it's like, no matter what I know, she's, you know, Amanda's Cuban Sicilian. So whatever it is, like no matter who I'm dealing with or who I'm up against, like I, I know Amanda's behind me and she's probably has a shank. Or some sort of piano. I was just wire. gonna say, hell yeah, right. she does. <laughs> <laughs> you know, it, when you have when you're that's your partner, like you really don't have concerns from a business level because if for someone who's a bankruptcy and commercial litigator, all you see is partnerships that fall apart because of fraud by one of the shareholders or something like that, where there's you know stealing corporate funds. Like I don't have to worry about that. If she's stealing, where she she right. you know. <laughs> news to me, right? Right. So like in what account that I'm unaware of. So there's just fundamental trust there. Uh, so that was, it was a relatively easy, I mean, relatively easy decision. And we've had our disagreements over things, but never like more than your ordinary business disagreements about how to handle something like advertising or whether to take on a client or not. You know, those things happen. You can't avoid them. You can have them with whoever your partner is. But it was funny because Amanda is, phenomenal attorney she's gorgeous she is uh very smart yeah <laughs> and uh but she you know she's forceful about like what she wants so it was funny when we were starting the firm her family is very italian american they're like tom all due respect to you i'm ready for it yeah <laughs> but a man that gets her way right <laughs> so like Right. So like and this it's like coming from her uncle and her like Amanda's family, the way it's set up is her mom is like twelve years younger than her aunt, who's Amanda's godmother. So she has cousins who are first cousins who are like fifty and Amanda's thirty-three. Right. So they're at the same general generational line, but their kids are twenty and we're thirty, you know, mid thirties. So we're like right in the middle, which is like makes like an awesome family dynamic. Because it's like at parties, it's like, uh, you know, them, us, and the, you know, the kids, they even know they're not kids anymore. So they said, they're like, Tom, you know, like De Niro from Goodfellas is like, Tom, we love her, but she gets her way. And I don't know if you have the tools to, uh, to make her see your way. I'm like, oh, it's going to be all right. Like, you know, I can reason with her. And it was just this, they, like, it was the funniest thing. But we've always been able to eventually get, eye to eye on all major issues. And whenever I make a decision that's like, you know, this is my call and I'm going to do it anyway, I always end up being wrong. Like I should have just <laughs> listened to her. Right. It, every, literally every time I'm like, what the hell was I thinking? She's going to record that piece of the podcast and she's going to have it on repeat forever. Yes. Yeah. We should have to go <laughs> and have that out there. Now, of course, you live together, you work together and everything. Obviously, it's not work, work, work all the time. But how do you and I'm speaking at this from an entrepreneur standpoint, I mean, it's hard to turn off. And especially if my partner was my business partner, too. I don't know that I could personally turn it off and be like, "Ooh, I have this idea because I think of ideas at 11 p.m., 2 a.m., whatever that may be. Right. So how do you differentiate work, life 
I mean, not say work-life balance because there really isn't one with an entrepreneur, but how do you do that? What's that dynamic? Um, it's tough. It took a long time to get to a point where we were like, not calendaring time for one another, but almost doing that. Right. Especially younger, I would work until like my body just gave out. Like I would just keep working. So like, I don't have hobbies, still don't really. And it's like, what are you going to do? And I said to my brother, like, there's something wrong with us that we can't like enjoy downtime. Because I'm like, what would you do with downtime? He's like, I would probably get ahead on work. And I'm like, that's exactly what I would do. And that just, when you're, you know, mid twenties, no kids, not married, you could do that then, but mid thirties, two kids under the age of four and a marriage, like all of those things need time and attention. You can't just keep working all the time. So it's more like just certain times are not, are like sacrosanct and you don't work during those days or those times. Um, so like if it's a, you know, Friday nights we go, we have date night. We, you know, for a while it was hard to get like childcare because of COVID. Right. So you didn't want to like leave your, you know, you didn't want to go out. You didn't want to welcome someone into your home because you didn't know what was happening, especially when the kids are so young or Amanda's pregnant. Like you just, it was a weird time. So for a while we just had like no escape. And anyone would tell you that like young parents in that time would tell you that it was a tough time. But eventually we got great childcare and they were like, tranches to it like backups in case like someone gave out oh good mm -hmm. now we have like our date nights and i try not to work past 7 p.m on weekdays now like sometimes it'll happen you know there's a deadline or something you can't avoid it but we usually try to like block off that time to just like hang out watch a new show or just you know shoot the shit with one another and weekends we both really try not to work right take the kids for breakfast and take them to the park and stuff like that we try to like not you don't have to work during those times. Some people, you know, if there's an emergency, yeah, but it should be rare. It shouldn't be all the time. So it's really like, I, it actually came to me after like seeing a therapist because I was like, there's something wrong that I like don't, one, I'm tying my self-worth to my success. So like as a litigator, you're going to win and you're going to lose. It's like, right. that, like you're, no matter how, if you were the best hitting baseball player ever, you're still going to be unsuccessful like 65% of the time. So if you're tying your identity to your success, like you're going to have like a crisis. So I, I realized that I was like, I have to walk this back. Like I have to get away from this. And, you know, one of the things my therapist said was like, you need to stop. Like work is all or nothing, like all the time for you, no matter what. Like if you have spare time, let's work. If you feel anxious, let's work. Like it's your response to everything. You have to stop doing that. And your response when you're kind of like, and every, every entrepreneur knows that, like when you're so tied up in what you're doing, you start to like lose, you're not present, right? You're not present in what's going on in your life. And when that happens, you start to really start to drift and it gets worse and you have to ground yourself to whatever works for you. And she's like, you need to ground yourself in your family. Like, Instead of when you're anxious, don't work more. Sit down, put your phone away, have dinner with Amanda, hang out with her, play with the kids. Like that'll bring you back. So it's like all those, that trial and error led to a place where it's like, all right, you know, that's not the answer anymore. If I'm like jammed up at work and can't see past legal issue, I shouldn't work more. I should like take a step back. But it's hard to, and especially when you have the mentality of like, prove me wrong and I'm yeah. going to do that. And I also have a very hard time relaxing. I'm like, oh, well. Yeah, get ahead on work or let's do an extra post on LinkedIn or, oh, I'll be ahead of next week so I could do that. But it's extremely hard to step away when you have big goals and, you know, I'm sure want to leave a legacy for the kiddos too and everything. And it's a lot. It's very, very challenging. So I'm just sitting here nodding my head and like, yeah, mm -hmm, I feel that. Yes. Right. I, I wish I had like a, a, like a clear cut way to do it. Like working out obviously helps. Like if you were, if you could get, you know, I know Arnold Schwarzenegger would kill me if I said this, but he, it's like, I just have trouble finding the time because he was like the Pope and the president work out. They could find the time. You could find the time. And he's right about that. But but they have boards of advisors and they have hundreds of people working for them. It's different. Like during the summer, we'll go to LBI, which is like a, it's Long Beach Island. It's like the South Jersey. And it was like a week we were there. We usually go for like a week. And at the end of that week, I realized like I didn't feel anxious once. Ooh. And I was still working during that time. Like, 
light, but like still answering calls and emails. And I was like, what was the common denominator the whole week? And it was because like we're on the beach, I'm constantly looking at my kids to make sure they're not by the water or not, you know, eating a pound of sand. (laughs) And it was like, I had to be present that whole time because like at risk of my kids safety. And I was like, that was it. That's the key. Like you just have to do things every single day to like, obviously it's easier on vacation, but you just have to do things every single day to like, just keep yourself grounded and present, whatever it is, you know, and just so it doesn't slip away from you. But it's tough. Like that's a constant battle. Well, and I think it's different too, because I've had some friends or some people that aren't entrepreneurs, not to say we know better than them, but I've had some people that are like, well, you shouldn't look at emails on the weekend or you shouldn't do, you shouldn't work. You're on vacation. Like I'm going to Florida actually tomorrow till Friday. And they're like, oh, well, you should stay away. I'm like, no, 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 no. You don't understand. It helps my anxiety to know that things aren't on fire. Right. If I could spend a half hour while, you know, in your case, like kids are taking a nap or whatever and just knock some stuff out, it will help me better. So I don't feel like I need a vacation from my vacation. That's the difference. Yeah, exactly. You got to stay in touch a little bit. You like this complete disconnection is not happening. Like that's not going to help you. No. Right. You, you got to stay connected to it a little bit because it's, you know, it's like another child, you know, uh, like Literally. so much of the of you goes into it. And it's a, you know, it's a small business. I don't know any small business that could just stop, like the owner could just stop doing what they're doing to like make sure things are running smoothly. And maybe, you know, maybe there's some of them, but I don't know of any of them, maybe because I'm a bankruptcy attorney. No, I know a lot of people that are not in bankruptcy and I don't know anyone that does that either. So, yeah, exactly. So that's the, the life we chose, I guess. You know, I would take it a million times over. Like the problems are, at least they're in your control. And you have freedom to do what you want to do when you want to do it. It's just, uh, you know, it, it, everything comes with its price. Yep. So, you know, as long as you're okay with the price, that's fine. Mm-hmm. And I will argue with you about the not having hobbies because I do have a lot of people, especially in my field of doing career services that say, well, I don't have hobbies. I feel bad about it. But the difference with you is you, you're spending time like nurturing the relationship with Amanda. You're nurturing the relationship with your kids instead of saying like work, 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 work. That's, I mean, that's a full-time job. That's three full-time jobs on top of the job you already have. So I think it's when people do have like, how do you not have hobbies or anything? It's like, okay, but how about you check your relationships with the most important people in your life and how are those actually going? Yeah, that's good. That's a good point. I feel better now. Thank you. You're welcome. I have two psychology degrees, Tommy. It's fine. (laughs) It is like, you know, where would you fit in? Like we used to belong to this, uh, this golf club in Manhasset and we like stopped going to it because they're like, oh, why? You know, you like there. I'm like, what are you talking about? It was a half hour there, half hour back. Golf rounds, four and a half hours. And we have two kids on the age of three there. Like, what? I'm just blocking out six hours a day and it's never six, just six hours. So it's right. like, why would I do that? And uh, it's a good point. I'm investing in those relationships rather than picking up like a hobby. That's not going to get me anything. no. The, the way someone said to me was like a hobby is devoid of productivity. Like it's not to be productive. It's just because you like doing it. And it's like a form of self-care. So it's like you're doing something just because it makes you feel good. And that's its only purpose. And if you're telling me you can't do a hobby, you're telling me you can't do something that's just for you. I'm like, and I don't have any hobbies. Damn and it. You said it right. So it's like, what do you say? Like, Wow, I really don't, you know, and that's where it comes in. It's like every, someone, someone was saying it the other day, like everything I do is productive. Even if I say I'm doing something like, oh, I'm just going to read. And it's like, what are you reading? It's like, oh, you're reading, you know, about business or something like that. It's like everything is towards this thing that is secretly the only thing you care about, you know, aside from family. Okay, I'll stop putting reading on my uh, (laughs) hobby list as I'm reading like why why most small businesses fail right now. And yeah, Yeah. and when I write, it's towards the book I want to write one day. So exactly. Okay, now now I feel worse. So thank you, but no. We gotta you know first step to a problem is identifying there is one. Yes, you know that's what it is. Right. And it's funny because I think growing up, at least in my household, was very much like, oh, you're sitting on your ass. Clean your room. Do this. Do that. Like we were go, go, go. Do this. Do that. Played three sports up until junior year of high school. So 
I mean, scheduling was very much like that. So I, yeah. we didn't really have downtime. And, you know, being social, I was like always out with friends, always want to do this. So I don't know how to relax. I know that. Yeah, yeah it's, and it's good. Like it serves you. Something, uh, I was born with like the, this genetic condition called cystic fibrosis, which is like, um, it's, it's rough, but like they, they basically cured it now. But don't tell my doctors I said that. I won't. Secret safe. You didn't cure it, wait, you know. But basically, it's like when I was born, they told my parents, like, he's going to not make it until 18. Uh, and then when I was like five, they're like, all right, I'll make it to 32. Uh, so, uh, so much of my day was just productivity, like be healthy, like work out, exercise, like everything was towards this, this end. So I was talking about it once and they were like, listen, your, your job for the first 30 years of your life was survival. And it was like, now you just want your mind to switch and be like, I'm going to do this thing just because it's fun. It's like, that's not how you're hardwired now. No. Like, mm -mm. 30 years was this, right? So like, same thing, like eight, you know, your first 18 years of life was like, boom, 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 boom. It's like the groundwork's been laid. You know, how are you going to shift it now? You're not going to. Yeah, you know, it's just not happening. Exactly. That's okay. Mm -hmm. That makes sense. Jeez. You're, you're just so, I, I could like, this could be a two hour podcast. Like this, I'm like, yeah. so funny. But as we wrap this up, so we keep listeners under an hour here. What advice do you have for listeners? My advice for listeners would be like from a legal perspective, like call an attorney sooner, right? Virtually every attorney gives free consultations. Like don't make a decision just because like you're afraid to deal with consequences or don't stick your head in the sand. Like there's so many people who come to us after they made a decision they shouldn't have made and they want to unwind it. And it's like, why didn't you call somebody? Yeah, like it just happened the other day where someone just stuck their head in the sand and it's just like, why did you do that? You could have just called somebody. You could call me, you could call that. I don't care who you call, call somebody. Call a friend who's an attorney, call somebody and just ask them to point you in the right direction. Almost every attorney nowadays will give you either a free consultation or a discount consultation. Just contact them, ask the questions, and you may be stepping into a landmine that could save you like so much time and heartache. That and my other piece of advice is find a hobby. <laughs> Are you going to take your own advice? <laughs> That's awesome. So, I love it. Well, Tommy, this was a lot of fun. For those of you listening, if you want to check out Tommy and more of what he does, head to the show notes and tune in again next week for another episode of That's Business. 